Hi everyone, it is 12 o'clock, so we will get started. Uh, today we are very fortunate to have Dr. David Kaiser from Montreal Public Health to talk to us about public health surveillance of housing conditions, recent data from Montreal, and thoughts on improving impacts on policy. So just a brief um, bio on uh, Dr. Kaiser. So just a reminder for everyone on the phone, please mute your phones during the presentation so that we can hear David. Uh, so Dr. David Kaiser is a specialist physician in public health and preventive medicine. As consulting physician at Montreal Public Health, he is responsible for housing and works on a variety of other environmental health issues, including environmental health noise and extreme heat. He has a particular interest in public health surveillance, especially with regards to using surveillance data to influence public policy. He is program director of the public health and preventive medicine residency at McGill University and clinical assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics and Occupational Health at McGill University and in a Department uh, de Medicine Sociale et Preventive et de l'École de Santé Publique de l'Université de Montréal. Please welcome Dr. David Kaiser. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so my bio uh, is necessarily short because uh, I haven't been around for that long. So that was already probably making it sound a lot more impressive than, than it should. Um, so uh, we have an hour today. Um, in the invite, uh, the, the idea of today's uh, presentation um, was to talk a little bit about what we've done at uh, Montreal Public Health over the last few years. Um, in terms of generating knowledge around housing conditions and their impacts on health, um, including our most recent housing survey that, uh, that we completed last year, um, and thinking a little bit about I mean, what impacts we've uh, been able to see, um, but also having people uh, uh, around the table on the phone uh, from across Canada uh, where uh, we might have a greater impact if we work together. So uh, I think we should have plenty of time uh, for, for a little bit of discussion and questions at the end. Um, and I'll get started uh, just by saying thanks uh, to uh, all the people who contribute uh, uh, every day to the do. Everything okay? Um, so, if everybody is hearing me, I don't see a uh, sound. Okay. If everybody is hearing me, I'll <laughs> go back to uh, my slide. So, uh, the housing team here, a uh, uh, couple of whom are on the phone, uh, uh, Melanie, who's an environmental hygienist, uh, Stefan and, and Louis, who are uh, great. Thanks for the thanks for the, uh, the <laughs> indication that there is sound. Um, Stefan and Louis, who are also uh, uh, physicians, uh, public health physicians. Uh, uh, Karen, who is a uh, uh, public health uh, uh, professional, and Bernick, who is our uh, manager, um, and uh, Sophie and Céline, who uh, uh, do a lot of the data analysis and, and did the work to get the maps and tables that, uh, that I'm presenting today. So the idea is uh, just to contextualize a little bit the, the work that we do. So uh, every uh, public health system in Canada is different, um, and Quebec is uh, uh, probably the most different uh, in uh, the, the way that public health is structured. Um, and then getting into uh, uh, the types of uh, data that we've been able to, to generate, and, and as I said, looking at the uh, thoughts for, for uh, improving or impacting uh, policy, uh, uh, which is really what we're here to do. So the public health system in Quebec is organized regionally. There are 18 regional public health units that uh, cover uh, an area that can be very variable in size and population. Um, the, the public health unit in Montreal covers essentially the island of Montreal, so it's not quite the entire metropolitan region population of about uh, 1.8 million people. The funding comes from the Ministry of Health. There are no intersectoral boards of health. Um, so public health is really within the health system and doesn't have a formal uh, relationship with, uh, for example, municipal partners that is, that is enshrined uh, in, in, in the legal framework. And the Public Health Act in Quebec uh, uh, comes from... Uh, awesome. Was 
passed in 2001, um, provides a legal framework for public health action, and there's really a, a very limited capacity in day-to-day -day work for direct intervention. And so the, the function of surveillance and being able to generate data that is useful for influencing the interventions that other uh, actors uh, uh, may undertake is really a, a, an essential part of our public health mission. In Montreal, uh, we have uh, more than 30 municipalities on the island of Montreal. So there's the city of Montreal that has uh, uh, 19 boroughs and there's 13 independent uh, cities on the island. And so it's a very complex uh, municipal infrastructure. And when uh, we're talking about housing, inspection and bylaw enforcement is a municipal responsibility. Um, so uh, as opposed to a, a lot of other jurisdictions in Canada, inspe housing inspection is not a public health responsibility. It doesn't mean that we don't have any role to play in in uh, on in the field work, but inspection is really at the level of municipality, and each municipality has uh, uh, or doesn't have its own bylaws around housing. Um, more specifically, housing as a determinant of health. Um, let's say 10 years ago, housing was not at all situated as a public health issue in Quebec, uh, um, and uh, I, I had put originally in this slide is still not really. I was told I was too pessimistic, but uh, uh, we're not at a at a stage where we can say that everybody agrees uh, that housing is a fundamental determinant of health, and we have to intervene in in a way uh, commensurate with that. Um, but certainly, Montreal Public Health and the work that's been done here over the last uh, seven or ten years has been instrumental in putting housing issues on the agenda, and the data has been a key aspect of that. So I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a, a series of uh, um, surveys, projects uh, that uh, we've done over the last uh, few years, um, and looking at three fundamental aspects uh, uh, of uh, any health problem, but housing as a determinant of health, that we need to be able to build uh, an argument for intervention, to be able to uh, influence policy, and to be able to understand impacts. Um, and the first is, is exposure, so housing conditions uh, per se. Um, I think important to kind of situate it in a context where uh, there is essentially no federal, provincial, or municipal surveillance uh, of housing conditions. Um, so there's, as you all know, I'm sure, the one indicator in the census on uh, need for repairs, um, but that, that doesn't really tell us much about uh, um, impact on health. I mean, uh, somebody who uh, uh, feels that their kitchen uh, is getting a little old may uh, 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 check the box for minor repairs, whereas uh, a poor immigrant family living in uh, a bed bug infested apartment uh, may, may not indicate that there uh, is any need for repairs at all. And so uh, from a public health perspective, it's not a, a terribly useful indicator. In our provincial surveillance systems, we have nothing, and at a municipal level in Quebec, um, there is no, so there is clearly administrative data that is generated, but it is not used uh, in a surveillance capacity to understand the scope of the problem and, and to understand the evolution of, of exposure. And in the literature, I mean, public health surveillance is not something that uh, it lends itself well to getting articles published, and so there's very limited publicly available data on prevalence and distribution in urban settings elsewhere. Uh, say a, an exception to this is New York that has a, a data portal um, and where there is information on, on housing conditions from a variety of sources, but otherwise it's not that easy to be able to compare, to say uh, if our prevalence is X, uh, how does that compare to, to other cities across Canada or across North America? So the, the approach uh, here has been uh, to uh, um, uh, generate exposure data uh, primarily through telephone surveys. So starting in 2010, um, with a couple of questions on housing around bed bugs, cockroaches, uh, molds, and water damage in omnibus surveys, a thousand respondents twice a year um, from 2010 to 2012. Um, and then through two iterations of uh, housing specific surveys in 2014 and 2017, um, we start to have a, a fairly good base for uh, describing the prevalence and spatial distribution of, uh, of inadequate housing conditions in terms of pests, mold and water damage, some information on safety and upkeep, uh, and then around affordability and, and links with food security. 
Um, and uh, the first, so the first housing specific survey that we did uh, was in 2014. It was extensively used in this uh, 2015 report on housing that, uh, that was uh, produced by Montreal Public Health. Um, and it's a survey of uh, 1,600 respondents in Montreal, uh, including 1,000 tenants. Um, and this was the first time that we uh, were able to generate, able to generate um, uh, data on prevalence. Maybe somebody needs to mute, please. Um, data on prevalence for a variety of uh, housing issues and stratified by ownership status. Um, and so uh, when we're talking to uh, municipal decision makers, uh, our colleagues in the health system, uh, uh, or, or trying to lobby for changes uh, in, in regulation or policy, then being able to uh, highlight uh, uh, figures like this can be really useful. Uh, uh, because, uh, uh, for example, bed bugs, there's a, a, a common uh, kind of idea that anybody can bet, get bed bugs. Uh, and it's true. If you go on vacation uh, and, and you are unlucky, you may even bring, bring bed bugs home. But if you're a property owner and, and you're minimally organized, you'll probably get rid of them pretty quickly. Um, and the, the population situation is actually that uh, the prevalence of bed bugs and cockroaches is essentially nil uh, amongst property owners um, and uh, is at 5%, so 1 in 20 uh, annual uh, prevalence among uh, tenants. And so uh, that is, is quite useful information that we've been able to uh, use um, in, in speaking about the importance of, of intervention. And at the same time as the first uh, 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 survey with which we were able to map uh, at a sub-regional level, so have data uh, that was a little more detailed than just for the island uh, in terms of uh, distribution of some of these issues. So this is a map for bed bugs where uh, we see uh, that uh, this is uh, the downtown of Montreal. Uh, and uh, the prevalence is much higher in the central boroughs um, and essentially non-existent in the eastern and western suburbs that are more affluent and, and that are much more uh, 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 dominated by uh, property owners. Uh, a second uh, um, a more targeted survey in 2016 was looking at specifically at residential pesticide use. This was uh, province-wide um, and in collaboration with the Provincial Ministry of Health, with the Provincial Public Health Institute, with the uh, um, uh, uh, CNSST, which is the um, uh, Workplace uh, uh, Compensation Board, um, and also on our, on our uh, uh, committee, we had uh, a local representative from the Pest Management uh, Regulatory Agency of Canada. Um, and it was a survey of 3,000 respondents, which uh, we did because of the, the uh, resurgence of bed bugs in Montreal and the importance that we felt to, uh, that we needed to document uh, uh, potential um, concerns, impacts on health related to pesticide use in that context, where uh, we saw that there was definitely uh, uh, for that specific issue in Montreal a huge increase in the number of, uh, of uh, pesticide applications over the space of five, six years. Um, and we want to have an idea of uh, how that played out uh, uh, provincially and at the level of population. Um, and so that the type of data that that allows us to generate with 3,000 respondents is a global prevalence. We see one in seven households uh, say they've used pesticides uh, inside their dwelling uh, in the course of a year, um, and that uh, there actually aren't uh, uh, important differences in terms of uh, uh, income, in, in terms of uh, property, so ownership status, um, but that there are some differences in terms of location. So these are the census metropolitan areas of Montreal, Quebec, and the rest of the province, where clearly there's something going on in Montreal that uh, we can probably link to more of the urban uh, housing issues, bed bugs and cockroaches. What it also allowed us to do is generate, this is a busy, busy table, uh, but the idea of being able to generate data for the entire province of Quebec um, and to show that yes, in Montreal, so in the, the census metropolitan area, uh, the issue of bed bugs is, is more prevalent than the rest of the province, but it isn't absent elsewhere. And so it's not just a Montreal issue. This is uh, uh, an issue for bed bugs, for cockroaches, and for other uh, insect pests. Uh, a, a provincial issue. Um, and although we haven't 
quite gotten around to convincing everybody of this. It's certainly a, a really, really useful uh, uh, element that we can refer to um, for anybody who uh, wants to put us in our place by saying this is just a Montreal issue. Um, and finally, with our housing survey um, this year, um, which was the first that we did uh, with the city of Montreal. So again, just bring back to the structure of public health in Quebec. We're in the health system. We're not in the in the municipal system. Um, and there isn't an intersectoral uh, board. Um, so all of the work that we'd done before last year was uh, strictly uh, on our end. Um, but we worked hard. Um, in 2016 to uh, 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 initiate a collaboration with the city and uh, uh, we're working on the data now and I'm going to present a couple of, uh, of preliminary results. We haven't actually published this data yet but we will in the next uh, month or so. So this is a, a, a larger survey. We're aiming to have a, a, a better uh, sample size, especially of tenants, so 5,000 tenants. Uh, again, covering the whole health region, so the, the island of Montreal, uh, the population of about 2 million people um, and the data collection was uh, uh, last summer. And the type of data that we're generating um, is a little uh, more diverse and, and I would say more complete in terms of understanding housing conditions as a, as a, as a global determinant of health than what we had in the past, which was pest and mold. Um, so we definitely still have that and it's still a very important part of what we want to be able to follow in time and document. Um, but we added a lot of information on uh, safety, upkeep, uh, uh, perception of the quality of housing, uh, um, uh, relationships with or, or, or inter interface with the, the type of property ownership, uh, whether it's a, a, a large company, whether it's a small owner, whether there's uh, personnel on site. And a lot of that stuff we have yet to, to analyze, but it's going to be a really, uh, it is a rich database that uh, um, we're going to be able to exploit. So this table gives an idea of uh, some of the indicators around uh, the perception of quality of housing. Um, so we asked people a whole series of questions about how they how they uh, felt about their their dwelling, and this is uh, data only for tenants. Um, and so, for example, asking people whether their their dwelling is large enough, and eight percent. Uh, so one in one in twelve about say that it's not uh, whether it's adapted to their physical needs and, and age of or with the physical needs and age of, of the occupants is about the same uh, percentage whether they don't feel safe in, in their uh, in their dwelling you see that around four uh, percent say they don't feel safe in their home so we're not talking about community safety we're talking about in their home uh, really surprising finding we never had this kind of data at a population level uh, but if it's true it's it, it's impressive uh, uh, again almost one in 12 uh, uh, respondents tenant respondents who say that they have at least one door in their in their apartment that doesn't lock um, and then some uh, aspects that are uh, related to environmental conditions in addition to the quality of housing so uh, discomfort due to cold uh, for at least 24 hours in the winter and you see that uh, it's around 12 percent um, so a little more than one in ten tenant households that say their apartment is too cold uh, uh, in the winter and uh, about the double let's say uh, that it's too hot uh, in the summer for at least a day at a time um, and that corresponds very well with the fact that we know tenant households are more likely to be in heat islands in Montreal and they're less likely to have air conditioning. And the, the other part, so in addition to expanding the, the range of indicators that we have available, we, we're also uh, looking at producing data or, or generating information in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way. So in addition to having these prevalence numbers, so this is percentage of, of tenant households with some idea of the precision and it's variable, but uh, this is for the whole island, so it's not too bad. Um, we're also providing an absolute number. Um, and this is really, again, looking at uh, how we can impact policy, how we can make policymakers understand what we're talking about. Um, and something like, um, 4% of tenant households saying they don't feel safe in their home. I don't know if it, it means something much to some of the people around the table. Maybe epidemiologists may be able to put that in perspective. Uh, uh, but uh, what we're gambling on and what we've seen already in presenting these numbers to some of our partners is um, that saying 23,000 uh, tenant households on the island of Montreal don't feel, don't feel safe in their dwelling um, has a totally different impact. Um, and, and the same for some of the classic uh, housing conditions indicators. Um, so this is, uh, again, indicators for water damage and mold, um, where you see that depending on which indicator we're looking at, the prevalence is variable, um, but 
fairly uh, consistent with what is in uh, uh, the available literature in terms of population prevalence. So if we're looking at a combined indicator of water damage, we're, we're around 30%. And if we're looking at more uh, visible mold or, 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 or uh, evident signs of mold, we're, we're at about 13%, so about uh, a little more than uh, one in, uh, or a little less than one in seven. And again, to translate that into numbers and, and uh, looking at the, the scope or the, the, the uh, size of the need in a city like Montreal, say that there are 70,000 households uh, in which there is visible mold. And the question here is actually specifically visible mold um, uh, greater than an eight and a half by 11 uh, sheet. So not a spot of mold in the bathtub, um, but really visible mold uh, on a surface that, is that, that, that we would consider uh, significant. Um, we're looking at 70,000 households and this, the, the amount of investment and the work that we need to do to, to address that, uh, I think is better uh, um, understood uh, when we're talking to uh, decision makers than if we, we are talking in percentages. And the, the last table is the same, same idea for bed bugs, cockroaches, and, and rodents. And where we see that bed bugs in tenants, we have a population prevalence of about 4%. So uh, in any given year, we estimate there are about 22,000 households that have bed bugs uh, in Montreal. And again, bringing that back to uh, trying to change uh, practices, perceptions, and, and eventually policy, um, that is at least two orders of magnitude larger than what many uh, of our um, colleagues uh, that are inspectors uh, would estimate as the, the uh, population prevalence because the number of people who actually uh, end up uh, lodging complaint and who are in the administrative databases is significantly, significantly smaller. So that's some data from our, our most recent housing survey, and, and it, I think the idea here was to show the evolution of the type of data we've been able to generate um, and where we're at today, uh, uh, and, and maybe give people ideas about uh, what we might be able to do with that. Um, and it allows us to say things like that. So 22,000 Montreal households have bed bugs over the course of any given year, which is uh, uh, something that we're going to hammer at uh, in June when uh, moving season comes along in, uh, in Montreal. A uh, second category of, um, of uh, surveillance data that uh, we've worked a little bit on and that is really uh, fundamental to being able to uh, uh, talk about housing as a term of health is health outcomes, obviously. Um, and again, uh, nothing in provincial federal databases on housing specific uh, health outcomes. So, for example, attributable fraction of X problem related to housing. Um, and in the literature, obviously in the scientific literature, there's an abundant literature for uh, the relationship between humidity molds and respiratory health, but limited literature for most uh, other exposure outcome relationships and really, really limited in terms of uh, uh, literature on the burden of disease. So uh, uh, one example of a study that we, we did here, and so my colleague uh, Louis Jacques, who uh, uh, led this study, um, is a respiratory health in children study. So looking at uh, three respiratory conditions, uh, asthma, rhinitis, and, and respiratory infections in children, big study of 8,000 kids, um, and with which we were able to generate um, attributable uh, fractions. Um, and so the map here is a map of Montreal with, uh, in the background, uh, variation in the prevalence of asthma and in the foreground uh, attributable fraction for three uh, uh, modifiable conditions where the blue is uh, humidity and molds and where we see that the attributable fraction is variable uh, uh, across the, the territory. And why uh, this is so important is because again it allows us to generate uh, numbers uh, in terms of the burden of disease and uh, uh, telling a, a decision maker, whether it's in the health system or in, in, in one of our, uh, in one of the part, intersectoral partners, um, that uh, mold is real bad because uh, it causes uh, asthma, um, is maybe not as powerful as saying on the island of Montreal, uh, at any given time, there are about 10,000 kids that have asthma, rhinitis, or, or respiratory infections because of their housing. Um, and so the ability to generate uh, numbers uh, I, for the convincing, uh, for example, our uh, ministerial decision makers and, and, and decision makers in the health system that this is worth investing in um, is fundamental. <clears throat> 
A uh, second study that uh, is a little different in, in, in type, but that has been really important in uh, helping us build a case for work on specifically bed bugs is this uh, very small study uh, that was uh, led by a resident uh, in public health and, uh, and uh, my colleague Stéphane Perron uh, on uh, bed bugs and mental health. So a very small uh, case control study of uh, looking at anxiety, depression symptoms and sleep disturbance in, in people with bed bugs. Um, and uh, this is a, a um, cross-sectional study, um, so we can't uh, speak of causality or, or knowing whether uh, people with mental health system, uh, symptoms are more likely to have bed bugs or whether people with bed bugs are more likely to, to, to develop mental health system, symptoms. But what we can say is that it's fairly clear that uh, anxiety symptoms and sleep disturbance are way more prevalent um, in people uh, who uh, have a current bed bug infestation. And with our housing survey in 2014, um, we were able to look also at the affordability and food security. So food security is not obviously a, a direct health outcome, but has a, a, a fairly uh, direct links to uh, uh, a lot of uh, health outcomes that we're interested in. Um, and again, linking that clearly to affordability was something we're not able to, to do easily with uh, federal and provincial databases. Um, and that having our own data and be able to ask the question question um, at the individual level uh, as to how much people spent on their housing and, and looking at indicators of food insecurity allows us to generate uh, data like this where you see that even among tenants, uh, uh, the difference that affordability makes uh, is about uh, uh, two to three fold in terms of uh, prevalence of food insecurity. And if we compare it to, uh, to owner households, um, it's an order of magnitude different. And the last category, um, so you saw that that category is, uh, was a lot smaller. Uh, uh, we have been able to generate a lot more data and, and, and I think get a lot further in terms of basic exposure data um, than uh, the, the data on health impacts. Um, and it's a bit the same for interventions. So here looking at what interventions in the, in the field in our population actually have an impact either on exposure uh, and ideally uh, on, on health outcomes if we can measure them. Um, and the context here is that there is a bit of literature. Um, there is literature on, on water damage, but that is not of great quality, a lot of really tiny studies, um, but that, that suggests that it makes sense that if there's a strong relationship between water damage molds and respiratory health, that if you if you fix the water damaged uh, materials, if you get rid of the mold, that there'll be a, a health uh, benefit. But they're not studies that allow us to to generate information on the burden of disease avoided. That's for sure. Um, there there's a whole set of uh, American uh, housing and urban development HUD studies on impacts of housing upgrades, uh, um, but uh, fairly context specific and difficult to uh, to apply elsewhere. And then there's obviously, uh, as people I'm sure know, an abundant literature on, on integrated pest management IPM, um, uh, but where uh, part of the challenge is applying that in real life and seeing what are the real impacts uh, um, uh, on the ground. Uh, so two studies that we've done, uh, that we published uh, recently, the uh, first study we published last year um, on uh, um, an intervention to accompany households in social housing units in preparing for pest control treatments for bed bugs. Um, and what we found, this is a very small, it's an RCT actually, uh, where uh, half of the, the households were uh, randomized to receiving this uh, additional support and the other had kind of business as usual, which was not no support, but which was the, what was usually offered by the social housing authority. And what we found with the limits of a uh, uh, small sample size and not, not a whole lot of power uh, was that intervention appears to be associated with uh, a lower number of treatments uh, needed to eradicate bed bugs and, and particularly, particularly so in more vulnerable uh, uh, households, so people with uh, mobility issues, mental health uh, uh, problems. Um, and kind of the follow-up to the uh, cross-sectional study that we had on, on bed bugs and mental health a couple of years before, um, we were able to, we followed people uh, over time and were able to see that in fact, when their bed bugs were eradicated, there was a reduction in, in uh, anxiety and depression symptoms. Um, and so that's really useful uh, uh, in being able to uh, uh, speak with authority about the importance 
of uh, dealing with this issue, especially uh, amongst more vulnerable populations, um, and that really we have an expectation that if we fix the problems, we will uh, reduce the burden of disease. And the second study is, is not uh, published yet. This is uh, another small study, uh, not randomized, a natural experiment. Um, it's uh, uh, in a housing, um, say a small neighborhood, um, so uh, uh, several thousand units, uh, private housing uh, owned by one big property owner, um, and uh, they um, decided to get rid of, in, in some of their buildings, the indoor garbage chutes and replace them with these outdoor uh, semi-buried uh, bins. Um, and so we used that opportunity to do a little pre-post study of the control group and evaluate the impact on cockroach density. And this is a place where cockroaches have been uh, very present for decades. And uh, the idea was to try and uh, uh, see whether this would, uh, would do something about it. And uh, what we found uh, was that in this uh, real life setting, natural experiment, uh, uh, zero funding, it's not a study that uh, we had uh, the ability to do really anything other than measure um, and analyze that uh, between the first and second phase of measurement, so where in between those two things uh, their uh, intervention was implemented, there was a, a dramatic reduction in the in the density. So this is the median number of cockroaches per dwelling um, that we were measuring in, uh, both in the control intervention group. Um, and so for us, it's really interesting because it's in a in a complex, really uh, difficult. Uh, environment, uh, uh, a lot of immigrant households, uh, a lot of poverty, um, a, a, a landlord who, although we work together, uh, or a property owner, we work together on this project, remains that it's a sort of uh, absentee, uh, a, a property owner that is in another city, um, all of the issues that go along with that, um, buildings that are old, that have a lot of uh, upkeep uh, needs. Um, and that we see that there is a capacity to impact uh, uh, exposure. Um, and the other part for us that's interesting is, well, it doesn't seem to be the intervention uh, that we were uh, looking at that has the greatest impact on, on exposure. Um, and that part is something that uh, leads into further further uh, uh, project and further interest for us to say, well, there are a bunch of stuff that clearly were changed at the same time. Um, and we have the capacity to understand on uh, having measured all these factors, well, what, what is the, uh, the difference between time one and time two if it isn't uh, necessarily uh, uh, closing those garbage chutes? Um, so this is the kind of, of study we hope um, uh, we can do more of uh, because uh, it's really what we're missing at a local level to be able to say in the specific uh, urban environment uh, in Montreal and where there are similarities between Montreal and other cities but also differences, what actually works, knowing that everybody should be implementing IPM and uh, uh, we have plenty of studies that show that that, that, that works, um, how does it actually work uh, in a real setting? Um, and uh, and really this is the kind of, of study that uh, we think we need, uh, we need uh, to uh, do to get some of those answers. So that's what I had to present in terms of uh, the work that we've done. I have a couple of slides on what what we've seen change uh, without attributing all the all the blame or all the uh, 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 responsibility for uh, those impacts uh, to us. Um, I think clearly uh, some of this has has had impacts, but also there's stuff that hasn't changed. There's uh, a lot of work that remains to be done, and, and that's what I would like to leave some time for uh, um, at the end. So, uh, just a little recap on where we're at uh, today. My reading of kind of uh, in terms of data for action, uh, what do we have? And and I would say that in the literature on housing remains that if we look at uh, housing as a complete determinant of health and not looking at very specific parts. Um, the literature uh, on exposure, on health impacts, and on interventions remains relatively sparse and uh, isn't complete enough. Uh, to just rely on that. Um, and at a local level, uh, I think what I've shown you reflects the fact that we've been able to generate a fair bit of data, and I think a fairly good quality data on exposure, but much less so on the, on the health impacts and on interventions. Um, and so uh, what the challenges in the literature for exposure that uh, a lot of surveillance data is not publicly available, and so it's hard to build on that. Um, at, uh, in terms of health and social impact is that there's a, a limited breadth 
So uh, very good uh, information on, uh, on mold and respiratory health, but uh, limited information on a lot of other things of interest. Um, and the same for interventions, that it's limited in breadth and not very good quality for everything but uh, IPM and, and kind of related uh, uh, issues around pest management. Um, so some examples of how we've, uh, despite uh, the fact that we're, we're far from uh, uh, having all of the information that we think would be useful uh, to really uh, be fully impactful in the work that we want to do, uh, a few examples in the last uh, couple of years of putting the data to work, um, and one I already presented, which is the, the housing report in 2015, which was really extensively used in lobbying uh, uh, at the municipal level, but also provincial and federal level. Uh, so it was uh, uh, just before the elections and there was a lot of work that was done uh, in the lead up to the elections and, and making sure that the, the idea of a national housing strategy was uh, was put forward there. And also the data was extensively integrated into um, uh, planning exercises at public health, but also in the local health units. And for our uh, most recent housing survey, um, we haven't got around to uh, even finishing the initial data treatment, and it's already being used by uh, by partners. For example, we we just had a, a request uh, to have data from a, a community partner for a public consultation on nature friendly communities. Um, and so the fact that we have a, a, a significant uh, base uh, uh, to work from, we can stratify to some extent, and we're able to provide them with uh, information on housing conditions for the elderly, um, which really nobody else. Uh, uh, can provide to them uh, at the present time. Uh, and for bed bugs more specifically, the prevalence data is kind of our most visible face on housing. I would say for the last 10 years is that every year uh, um, the media come back uh, looking for the prevalence number for the year and are very disappointed if it's a year in which we didn't do a survey because there's some understanding that we should be doing a survey every year. Um, and our, our kind of views though that, that number has been used as an indicator of success or failure. So whether it's going up or down is, uh, is uh, taken uh, as a uh, uh, as some kind of indicator uh, that for, for, for better or worse. Um, and uh, uh, for bed bugs and mental health, um, the work that we've been able to do um, has really been at the forefront and, and uh, the studies that, uh, a couple of studies I presented have featured prominently in the a chapter we wrote for, for this uh, uh, text, uh, Advances in the Biology and Management of Modern Bed Bugs, which was just published and which uh, uh, will be very useful again for saying, well, look, We've been telling you this for three, four years, um, but now uh, we managed to get it into uh, the reference text uh, worldwide on bed bugs. So uh, maybe it's time to act on bed bugs and mental health. Um, and I would say we do. We are in a situation now where data, the need for data, is, is increasingly recognized, and our data is seen as useful. Uh, um, there's some uptake at the ministerial level, so within our uh, health system, um, uh, but not to the extent that there, there's surveillance. And there's some evolution in, in the interventions at the municipal level. So we really have seen in 10 years an increase in the number uh, and in the competency of municipal inspectors. There is a program from the city of Montreal for accompanying vulnerable households um, for bed bug treatment uh, that really uh, reflects the, the results of, uh, of the study that, uh, that I presented. Um, but there's stuff that we really haven't gotten to. So I mentioned we still don't have uh, a proper surveillance system at a provincial or federal level. We, we're not yet at a point where we can say there's a unified vision of housing as a determinant of health, and a lot of action is still ad hoc. And we have very limited information on uh, burden of disease. And here I'm really talking about my, for example, 10,000 kids have asthma, rhinitis, or respiratory infections, and being able to um, quantify to some extent uh, the burden at a population level, uh, especially, especially for being able to influence decision making in the health system. Um, and our capacity is still extremely limited. We have uh, no stable academic partnerships uh, on housing uh, surveillance or research, and there are no specific, uh, there's no f uh, money or resources within the health system for housing related interventions. So in terms of knowledge development, I think uh, uh, it, I've already uh, highlighted uh, a couple of the areas where I think we have uh, a, a lot more work to do. Um, in terms of basic exposure data, it would still be, I think, really useful to have finer grain data. So as we, uh, as interventions evolve and we actually get to a point where 
there's a, a buy-in that we need to intervene. People need information that at, that's at a, a level uh, commensurate with uh, uh, the, the scope of the interventions. Um, and what we're going to be looking at in the next year is uh, using modeling approaches. So, for example, what we've used for air pollution or noise uh, um, and seeing if we can use that to generate finer grain data from the types of survey data that, that I showed you. Um, second is at a macro scale, so linking housing and urban development uh, uh, and, and looking Looking at the more the political and economic determinants of, of housing outcomes, so this is totally absent from what I presented to you, and uh, really totally absent from the work that uh, we've done in terms of uh, generating data. Um, and then the link with health and well-being outcomes uh, I mentioned, uh, as as with the evaluation of interventions. And so uh, I want to finish on this slide, which uh, um, is a kind of a stepping off point for uh, uh, people's uh, questions, comments, suggestions, and I hope uh, a discussion to come uh, uh, after this uh, webinar, which is opportunities uh, for collaboration uh, across the, the country. Um, where the first one, I've said it enough times, I think, uh, that uh, uh, it doesn't come as a surprise, but I think we have uh, uh, a job to do um, a pan-Canadian uh, uh, lobbying uh, initiative for inclusion of, of core housing indicators in, in uh, uh, federal surveillance systems. And, and I think there's an opportunity with the national housing strategy to look at what, for example, CMHC, the uh, Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, uh, um, does in terms of surveillance and making sure that it reflects uh, the types of information that we need to influence action and that there is a public health perspective to that. Um, second, uh, I, I think it's pooling resources. So one of the reasons that uh, we haven't done uh, uh, as much in terms of ideologic and evaluative research is that it's way more expensive, it's way more complex, um, and we're just, we're not a, a grant-based organization, we're a public organization uh, where we do this on the backs of uh, master students, residents, and uh, uh, try to uh, get uh, done what we can uh, with our uh, internal capacity. For sure, there's work to be done uh, in developing academic partnerships, but I think also to the extent that some of these issues are similar if not identical across the country in terms of the exposure response relationships and in terms of uh, uh, the types of interventions that we might want to see I think that pooling uh, resources in order to uh, have data that is uh, uh, of good quality is, is uh, somewhere where where we need to uh, uh, go further. Um, and similarly, the third point I put is uh, sharing experiences um, with regards to putting data to work um, and seeing what works, what doesn't work, how can we beyond generating the information, how can we uh, uh, translate it, how can we uh, present it, how can we uh, uh, communicate it so that it has a maximal impact. And, and I suspect that uh, um, without generating any more data, uh, we could have lots of interesting ideas from, from people out there as to uh, ways that we haven't thought of uh, to, to use this data or to present it or, or to communicate it differently. And I think that's really, uh, I mean, that was the, the, the uh, starting point for this webinar. Uh, um, and uh, I hope that uh, we'll uh, uh, be able to talk more about that. So that's what I had for today. Uh, we have about uh, 17, 16, 17 minutes left. Uh, and I guess I'll pass it over to Tina, I would guess. But thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you uh, to uh, NCCH for uh, inviting me. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, discussing with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, uh, for your excellent presentation. So I guess we'll move on to the question and answer period. And uh, for those of you online, um, if, if you could answer, uh, enter your questions into the chat window. And David, if you could open up the chat window, I think, in the, in the menu, uh, top menu, or the menu on the right, wherever yeah, yeah. you see Yeah, it. I think and I have it. Yep. Yeah. So um, if online participants could put your questions into the chat window, and then so I'll start with questions in the room first, if there are any. Lydia? Mm. This is here's mine. David, hello. Thank you very much for, first of all, uh, being willing to be invited. So it's our pleasure to have you share the unique and innovative work that uh, Montreal Public Health uh, via you and your team members uh, in undertaking and sharing with us across Canada your your housing data. 
um, you, you've addressed a huge build environment issue and uh, actually have data to show, which is fantastic. So I have a couple of questions uh, to, to start us off. First one is, how closely does and in what ways can Montreal Public Health or City of Montreal work with CMHC? You mentioned Canada, Canada, Canadian Housing Mortgage Corporation in addressing mm -hmm. some of those housing-related issues, perhaps in priority sequence. So how closely do you work and in what ways can you work with CMHC in addressing them? That's my first question. Should you start with that or do you want me to go on to my second question? Yeah, I mean, the answer is fairly simple. Uh, uh, so during the, the um, with the 2015 report, there was work that was done, uh, um, meeting with people from CMHC. Uh, there was uh, there were recommendations uh, that uh, were uh, put forward in terms of uh, uh, the type of data that they generate and 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 how better to uh, address uh, our data needs. Uh, um, but uh, I can't say that that has resulted in uh, or that there's a, 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 a conversation ongoing conversation and, and I can't speak uh, uh, honestly I can't speak directly to what the city of Montreal uh, has relationship with CMHD is but I can say that as a um, kind of uh, the two partners primarily uh, uh, interested in housing at an institutional level in Montreal we don't have an ongoing conversation with CMHC but I think that I mean, in, in putting together this, uh, this is one of the things that uh, clearly if, if we want to address pan-Canadian uh, surveillance needs, I think it's one of the places where we could come up with a strategy probably better together than alone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Thank you. So the question is, um, and the point first, is that yeah, I'm really glad in your closing slide that you mentioned sharing experiences uh, regarding using surveillance data to influence intersectoral action and public policy development, that's really key uh, as a takeaway. So here's my question. Given the unique profile of predominantly renters in your jurisdiction, could those housing-related environmental issues that impact health, as you pointed out, be solved through public health means? So by that, it, I also relate to your unfinished business slide, too, in that you indicated that intersectoral action often remains ad hoc. So given that this is a built environment issue, uh, I think that it's tough for public health alone to solve this issue, if not impossible. Surely the, the spurring for health indicators is a really great place to start. But, um, you know, bringing in the consideration that, um, that, that what we saw through your data is um, so much of it is leaned towards renters um, generated kind of uh, observations. How 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 could this be tackled? And I, I don't have any answers, I'm not sure you do, but it's an interesting phenomenon and certainly um, could help for the other provinces. You know, they, they, they might have some uh, thoughts and maybe some best practices and lessons learned that could be shared too. That would be very helpful. Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I might have uh, lost you on the question with all, all this other stuff, but yeah. No, I think that uh, that that's a part that is uh, I think uh, really probably very different depending on the jurisdiction. Just one little clarification is we um, progressively and really with the last survey made the decision to focus on tenants because of what we had already uh, seen in previous uh, data as to the distribution of risk, right? So, um, in terms of bed bugs, uh, all the uh, vermin, and even uh, uh, a lot of the uh, basic upkeep, uh, water damage, uh, tenants is really the vulnerable population that we're, we're most interested in for a variety of reasons. So it doesn't actually, the, the survey was stratified by ownership status, and it's not that there are 90% tenants on the island of Montreal, it's actually about the 63%. But it is much more than in some other cities. Um, the fact that we're outside the municipal system, I think, makes it um, really, really much harder on a day-to-day -day basis to impact uh, intervention. But on the other hand, it gives us an uh, uh, opportunity, um, I think, to look at the issue from a purely public health perspective um, and that's the trade-off that we have is um, I think we can if we do it right uh, 
the big advantage is that we can generate information that is as neutral or whatever you want to call it as, as, as we can get. And we can have a perspective that is as long long as we want to have. So if we want to take a 50-year perspective on it, we can because we don't have the direct uh, political imperatives. Um, and then the challenge is, is putting that into action. But uh, I don't know if it answers the question, but I, I think that the, the, the fact that um, we have a clear mandate for health protection, we have a clear mandate for um, health promotion, we have a clear mandate for surveillance, um, we have all of the legitimacy we need to uh, understand the problem and then to clearly uh, uh, indicate and advocate and lobby for solutions, um, I feel like that's a really strong starting point, even if at the end of it, we aren't the ones making decisions on kind of where the, where the money goes uh, um, and, and how uh, interventions are targeted. Um, I, th I think that we, we do have uh, uh, really quite a bit of leverage, um, and specifically for tenant households, because they fit very well into our health protection uh, 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 mandate. Great. Thank you. I have a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of questions that are coming in yeah. here. There are a few questions um, and some, some comments from um, a couple of people online. So uh, the first one talks about um, how did you do your housing survey yeah. through phone, email, and did you or did you pay a third party to conduct it? Yeah. So I'll start with that. That's um, uh, all of our surveys. Uh, the housing surveys that we did are are all phone based. Uh, um, up till now, we we had this discussion uh, in the last one whether we we're going to do multimodal and and. We ended up going with phones because we understand the biases fairly well, having done a whole lot of them. Um, and what we see in general is that we underestimate the, the scope of the problem because, uh, uh, as I'm sure people well know, the, the poorest uh, households, uh, uh, generally the most vulnerable, are, are, are missed in these types of surveys. So, But we, we in terms of the temporal series, uh, we decided to go with something that we knew, um, and that will likely change the next time, just as, as we're another couple of years into the future. Um, and we, uh, these are always um, external contracts. So we develop the questionnaire, we uh, develop the, the sampling strategy, we do all of the data analysis and, and, and treatment, but in between the actual data collections done by a, a survey uh, firm that is uh, hired uh, on a um, um, public tender. Okay. And, and uh, yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to, I was looking at the next uh, couple of questions. Um, so in terms of the next comment, which is it would be great to do this uh, uh, in cities across Canada, I totally agree. And uh, uh, I think that uh, every time, so we, we just finished doing a survey, but I can already see that if we want to do another one in a reasonable time frame, we have to start planning it. And I think a reasonable time frame is something like three years. Uh, um, and so I, I think that would be a great uh, thing to, to look at. Uh, in terms of uh, I increasing power, increasing comparability, um, and having a common uh, definition of some of the things that interest us. So that's all I can say. Uh, and then the next uh, uh, is what interventions work to improving private housing. I, get, I, I assume that means, um, I, I'm not sure actually what that means. Maybe uh, uh, does that mean owner, owner uh, housing or, or private uh, rental housing? Maybe the person who asked that question. Uh... Rental housing, she said. Yeah. Private rental. Yeah, so that's really what uh, what we're talking about here is private rental housing, and um, I think uh, in the short term, you, the the comment or the question mentions uh, um, kind of bylaw enforcement. In the short term, that's one of our uh, uh, targets is uh, bylaws, the bylaw itself, so the quality of the bylaw, but also bylaw enforcement. Um, but I think the other uh, um, aspect that we haven't worked on in any uh, serious way um, just because there's so many things to work on and that if anybody has experience, I think would be really interesting to, to talk about or to, to continue a, a conversation about is looking more at um, uh, uh, provincial uh, or federal uh, housing codes um, and having a more, uh, you know, a, a timeline that is commensurate with, say, the lifespan of, of the rental housing and saying over the next 
20 or 30 years, we know that this uh, housing is going to be replaced and we want it re replaced with something that uh, works better than what we have here. And that's a part that we haven't done. So there's a, you know, there's a building code uh, um, that uh, could probably be uh, uh, improved in order to uh, generate a housing stock that is less vulnerable to a lot of the things that, that we're seeing. So I think that would be a, a, an opportunity uh, uh, that we haven't explored uh, uh, really. And then the next series of questions is around, I think, bylaw enforcement. And uh, all I can say is yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so proactive inspection, uh, we, we've seen uh, people may be aware of some of the literature on that. So there's some uh, indication uh, from cities in the states that, uh, and we had a, we had a student do a, a project on this, that um, inspecting buildings on a regular basis uh, decreases the, the number of infractions that are detected in a reactive way. So there's some suggestion that, there that uh, uh, that uh, is probably a better approach and that increases uh, uh, investment in the housing stock per se. Um, and a lot of those systems are financed partly uh, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, user fees for landlords. Um, so uh, what would be better, uh, a proactive approach, a reactive approach, uh, a, an approach based on punishing landlords or approach based on incentivizing landlords? I think that this is what our next webinar should be about. And maybe since uh, people in Toronto are asking a lot of questions, maybe they can tell us a little bit about how their housing bylaw works um, and, and some of the things that they've seen. Because that is really, um, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of variability in, in how that is done. And, and we don't have good information on what works. And it's a totally legitimate uh, target for policy evaluation, I think, to see what, what really works and what are the outcomes we're interested in, in, in looking at when we ask uh, what works. Great. Thanks, David. So we just have one, one question from um, someone in the room here. Go ahead, Amy. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Amy from the BCCDC. Um, I've been doing some work around, or BCCDC has been doing some work around um, social isolation and housing. Mm -hmm. One of the things that comes up a lot is, the, uh, in, in my reading anyway, is the, I guess, the correlation between precarious housing, uh, precarious tendencies, things like dental eviction and rent eviction, and the mental health impacts that come from mm -hmm. those types of uh, situations. And there's been some studies out of the U.S. talking about the impacts of that and fragmenting communities and things like that. I'm wondering if there's anything being done uh, well, across Canada, but in Montreal, that uh, is studying the health the health consequences of that. Um, so, well, I'll speak for us. I don't know, uh, honestly, uh, elsewhere. Uh, I have some idea of the literature because we we uh, looked at that also in in the 2015 report. Some of those uh, aspects. I'll say two things. One study I didn't present today, um, which uh, is uh, in the final phases, is that we, we did a study on um, rooming house occupants this year, and we're, we're preparing the report. Um, and uh, I think there, without extending ourselves too much in terms of causal relationships, clearly this is a precarious housing uh, situation where we see that there is at least a relationship with uh, uh, poor mental health and poor perception of health and um, uh, a lot of those uh, well-being indicators. It's cross-sectional, so uh, that's to be taken with a grain of salt. The other thing I would say is that um, in the housing survey, some of the data I showed you, there's a, we asked a couple of questions around um, uh, I guess you could call social capital, um, really for the, for, in order to be able to um, look at how that interacts with some of the other uh, housing indicators that we're more used to using. So asking the, in, in our database, we will be able to look at um, a couple of questions around um, um, uh, social network. So do people have uh, neighbors that they feel comfortable asking to do them a favor? Do they feel safe in their neighborhood? And also, um, walkability, so do, what services do they feel are close enough to, to be walked to, um, and to be able to um, have that at an individual level uh, crossed with uh, uh, intersecting with the uh, presence of uh, classic indicators of uh, uh, poor housing conditions and also with affordability is kind of what we have, we're able to include um, but for sure, and we have a couple of questions actually on mental health, but again, it's a cross-sectional survey. We'll see what we can do with it, but 
we put those questions in because it's definitely something that is of interest. And if people have uh, suggestions or ideas, I think that would be really also uh, interesting to to talk about as we as we move forward. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. So we just ha we have a few more questions online in the chat box. We have about a minute left, David. Do you still do you have time to answer them, or should I? Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. okay. Uh, so the next one is about uh, uh, the hesitancy for RHAs of regional health authorities, municipalities, and provincial federal governments to make housing issues a determinant of health. <laughs> uh, I don't know who's on the line, so I'm not sure what I should say. Um, but, but I think to some extent, um, it's uh, that we, I, I'm going to give a boring answer, but I, I think it's partly that the people who are most impacted have the least voice. Um, and so at a political level, it's uh, not necessarily very risky to just put that aside. Um, you know, in Montreal, 62, 63% tenant households, um, tenant households are much more likely to be poor, to be immigrants to be uh, uh, in conditions uh, that are inadequate, um, those aren't the people that are going to be deciding the vote. Uh, so it's maybe not satisfactory, but I think that's a big part of it. And I think that's a place where public health has a role to play to say um, it's not a, um, it's not an economic, or that housing can't be seen as uh, uh, simply a commercial good in the same way as uh, uh, an iPad. Um, it really is a determinant of health. Um, and in that sense, uh, we have to treat it uh, in the same way, I think, you know, and this is surely not news to anybody, but I really think this is not yet uh, uh, understood as a fact but that we have to treat it more like food um, and uh, uh, basic uh, um, uh, necessities. And, and I think that in the national housing strategy, the idea of saying housing is a right uh, gets at some of that, um, but that is not where we're at. So if, housing is not, if, if, if good housing is not a right, um, and if the people who are stuck in bad housing uh, don't have much of a political voice, then uh, I think that uh, disincentivizes uh, uh, taking risks and, and acting on situations that are really, really, really complex. Okay, so next question. I'm going to skip over a few of the, just the comments. Um, so maybe we can take the question, uh, discussions offline, but there's another question yep. about would you have certified public health inspectors working in the health region to enforce a housing regulation or bylaw? <laughs> um, so that will never happen here because of the way that our uh, uh, systems are set up. That just is what it is. Um, but I think that if we, again, I'll come back to if we say uh, housing is a fundamental determinant of health and in order to treat it adequately, we need that perspective, then it seems to me that people who um, have a public health perspective uh, doing that part of the work, which is you know health protection, um, would be a good thing. Um, and I think we see that that seeing um, housing enforcement as a uh, an architectural or an engineering issue is very, very, very different from seeing housing enforcement as a health issue. Um, and to the extent that uh, public health inspectors, I mean municipal inspectors could have this this perspective as well. But to the extent that public health inspectors could bring the the perspective that housing is a health issue and that enforcement uh, it comes from a health protection perspective and not strictly from an architectural or engineering perspective, I think can only be good. Great. Um, so to what extent has the legislation contributed towards healthy and safe housing in your study area? Uh, so what I can say is that with the, the data at our disposal, um, so the stuff I presented and uh, you know other sources of data, we really can't say that um, there has been an improvement or a reduction in the exposures that we're able to measure. So, for example, water damage, molds, pests, uh, uh, etc. Um, and so, it's really a, it's a hard question to answer because at a population level, we don't we don't have like tobacco. We can say, well, compare 1980 to 2010, and we have a really nice graph. Um, for our housing conditions, we don't have that. And so does that mean that 
you know, the legislature, the, the fact that the city of Montreal in 2002 developed a, or implemented a bylaw that public health has invested heavily in pushing this issue forward has done nothing. No, but at a population level, I can't say that we have any data that says that our housing is in a better condition than it was 10 years ago. And I think that's what uh, orients kind of the, the conversation around either we're doing something wrong, we're missing information, uh, we're not hitting the right buttons, but clearly at a population level, there, 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 there isn't a big success story. Okay, and next question. Um, last question. Affordability is one of the major factors that drive poor families into unhealthy dwellings. Are there any strategies to address affordability besides legislation related to healthy and safe housing? Um, <laughs> yeah, poverty reduction, I mean, poverty reduction strategies, and again, I think that's where saying housing is a determinant of health uh, uh, makes the link into uh, uh, other uh, strategies on determinants of health uh, more easier. Um, but otherwise, um, I, I think that in the short term, our our approach or what, what we can achieve uh, with the what's at our disposal right now is to try to uh, weaken or break the link between uh, poverty and poor housing. Um, so that is on the physical condition. So if we can uh, change the relationship that there is right now in our city and, and in other places, that if you're poor, you're necessarily going to be in crappier housing and be more exposed to a lot of the stuff that we don't want you to be, um, then I think in the short term, we're farther along. That doesn't address the, the impact of affordability on food security and on other uh, aspects of health. But certainly that, I think in the short term, we can work on through uh, bylaw enforcement and through improvements in the quality of housing. But otherwise, uh, um, affordability for me, I think, uh, uh, comes back to uh, making sure it's tied into poverty reduction and making sure we bring that as a, as a, as a reason to say, when we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, a guaranteed minimum income or uh, social security or other poverty reduction uh, strategies, housing is one of the fundamental reasons that uh, we need to work on that. Great. Thank you so much, David. We've run out of time for webinar, and thank you. thank you for a great presentation. And for those of you on the line, if you have more questions, feel free to email uh, the NCCEH, and then we'll forward your questions to David. Would that be okay, David? Yeah, that's great. And uh, yeah, I, I really uh, appreciate, I mean, uh, uh, lots of really great questions. I hope that we have uh, uh, some opportunities to uh, 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 look at how we can work together on some of these because I think that we clearly are asking a lot of uh, the same questions and some people uh, uh, probably have much better answers than I do and, and I would love to hear them. So uh, thank you very much again. Thanks for the invitation and uh, looking forward to, uh, to uh, working together. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.